Hi everyone. Welcome to um, the fourth and final module of the FAIR Data 101 course. Uh, my name is Liz Stokes. I'm from the Australian Research Data Commons and I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are meeting today. Um, for me, based in Sydney, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to Elders past and present and, um, and acknowledge that this land has not been ceded. Uh, I would also like to extend a warm welcome to any First Nations people who are joining us today for this final module, reusable. Okay, so um, today let's let's get into this. Um, um, we are going to, so just front matter business first, um, please use the um, question or chat component for um, any questions or if you've got any tech issues at all today or if suddenly you can't hear me. Um, the NBN technician visited on the weekend, I'm pleased to announce and um, repaired not one but three broken cables between us and the node. So hopefully today works. Um, I do encourage you to um, use uh, the channels in the Slack also for after this webinar um, if you have further questions coming along um, and you can also tweet out using um, FAIR 101 or ARDC training um, on Twitter and there is also a link to our code of conduct um, uh, that we have for this course to ensure that it remains a friendly and accessible um, opportunity to get into the FAIR data principles. So today um, I'm going to start with an extended permacultural metaphor. Excellent things grow in compost like mushrooms and other fungi. Um, so for my first visual metaphor let's ground reusability in a permacultural lens which concentrates on the health of the compost and soil for excellent things to grow. Okay, so this um, reusability is going to concentrate on practical applications. Okay, the ultimate goal of the FAIR data principles is to optimise reusability. So the umbrella principle that data and metadata are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes um, is further defined by three um, sub principles or we could call them vice principles if you wanted, um, which highlight the importance of clear and accessible usage rights, data provenance and domain relevant community standards in supporting reusability. So how are we going to get into these? Here are some concepts I'd like to step through in the next 40 minutes or so and then we can have questions and answers. I will. Um, probably keep these things on a fairly high level and I know that's probably a little bit of um, an oxymoron to go high level and practical but I don't know that's probably the tension that we live every day. Um, however Matthias on Wednesday is going to expand on um, some of these into, um, into detail at a greater depth shall we say, um, and look at fair beyond data into the associated outputs in the glorious ecosystem um, that is research. So in practical terms, how do we talk about reusability and what aids data reuse? Um, in one sense, um, it's all about the metadata, keeping our eyes on the prize and looking at what the metadata is exposing and facilitating. So data that is available for reuse is accessible. And these are just sharing with you some, some thoughts that occur to me um, off the top of my head when I think about what that might mean. So um, I translate that into at the click of a button, I don't have to go deep into a um, into scrolling or any convoluted processes to actually access uh, the data. Um, the data is also well described. It does what it says on the tin, for example, um, which makes it easier for um, for searching and finding um, and retrieval. Uh, the data is also familiar. 
Okay, when I'm thinking about familiarity, I'm thinking about things like formats that are in current usage. I'm thinking about um, uh, the way that data is expressed or encoded um, appears uh, in, in ways that are familiar to its users. Um, that it is also easy to cite. Uh, so it's um, relatively painless for me to tell you where it came from. Uh, and also that it is licensed, okay? So that the providers, the creators of that data are very explicit in how you or I are allowed to use that data. So let's start pulling, this, um, pulling these fair data principles apart. So at one level, um, rich description, uh, that metadata are richly described um, with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes um, is an encouragement for the metadata author, whether they are humans, machines or data librarians, to be generous with their information, generous with volume and spe specific with regards to the structure of that data. For me, this brings to mind two things. Firstly, a rich or thick description. I'd like to get into a little um, ethnographic um, story. Uh, and secondly, a certain enthusiasm for machine readable metadata schemas, or rather documentation of metadata schemas that is machine readable and fair. Um, so, oh, damn it, I probably should have put an, a reference into the slides. I will add it afterwards. Um, I'm seeing, look, it's looking at me. Um, in my notes right away. So rich description brings to mind um, Clifford Geertz's maxim for anthropologists to provide a thick description in their field notes, that is to go beyond factual or literal descriptions. And he provides an example of reporting a wink. So instead of describing an eyelid stretching over an eyeball, um, uh, he encourages uh, ethnographers and anthropologists to um, consider uh, talking about providing the context um, in which that wink might have occurred. So looking at the social and cultural uh, things that are going on as well as the, the as well as a literal description of what is happening. Uh, I bring I bring this up um, because it's a I'm I'm talking now um, in this extended metaphor um, about uh, anthropological research practices, okay? Um, and um, these highly descriptive entries and monographs um, of anthropological research are all part of doing that kind of research. So for other researchers to glean insight requires deep and sustained reading. And even if this does become tedious for the human, it actually becomes impossible for the computer, which is unable to filter strings uh, by itself unless someone has manually marked up that text or provided explicit structure um, to the data or digital information there. So I'm just going to park that tension here for a bit and then move on to unpacking attributes which is um, that aforementioned um, enthusiasm I have for um, machine readable documentation of metadata schemas. Uh, and Another nice visual metaphor. Okay, so remembering that the core value of metadata is that it is structured data about data. Um, uh, I'll remind you of those con um, remind you of those concepts of data models that we were talking about in our um, previous module. So metadata assumes that the research data we are concerned with is always already structured and that this principle goes for the metadata which describes or structures the research data as well as the data itself. So for the fair sharing of research data, this accurate and relevant attributes point towards what gives us basic information about it, information about how to find it, the act, what it's about and the permitted usage. Content descriptions should cover both the content Hi everyone, we're sorry about the technical difficulties. Um, if you will please bear with us, I will attempt to just take over from where Liz left off. Thanks Matthias. Am I oh. back? 
Oh, sorry, I do not need to take over because Liz is back. <laughs> All right, cool. Liz. Um, Where did I get up to? Uh, you had just gotten onto uh, this slide uh, with the rice patties. All oh, right. Okay. Excellent. Great. Okay. On with the show. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry, everyone. I appreciate your patience. Um, clearly, I did not touch wood when I extolled the virtues of the NBN. Um, moving right along. Okay. So let's let's have a look at this metaphor that I have thrown up for you. Um, uh, so, as I was saying, talking about the content and the context and giving a rich description um, of, of metadata and, and this research data, um, sometimes, um, so those, those practices in research, research practices that are familiar with us are not um, instantly translatable sometimes to, uh, to computational processes. So, um, when we do want to do something like that, we have to take a few steps um, of structuring our data in ways that can make it possible to harness the power of technology. So, for example, um, when we're making decisions about weighing up the purpose of what, our, what we're describing, um, we're doing that against the utility of describing it. We might not need to describe everything in a rich semantic ontology. Maybe it's only a, a few components. It really depends on weighing up costs and time and effort that are available to us. Um, so in this balance between describing everything and what is fit for purpose for our users, whether they are researchers or data librarians, stewards, etc., cetera, um, sometimes it might mean that not all of the detail goes into one long um, notes field, for example, which even though it's tedious or could be delightful for some humans, it is generally impossible for the computer. So here we have fields which are arranged according to the content, context um, in the shape of a landscape here. So now I'm going to really go into this metaphor. Obviously, they are also impacting the shape of the landscape and how that landscape is exploited for agriculture. In this image, not all the landscape is structured terrace rice fields. Um, the farmers have made a decision about how to optimise the land for farming. As you can see, it's not all one uniform or level field, literally, and in some cases you can see it's not structured at all, um, potentially over around the borders of these structured um, rice paddies, we can see maybe some um, banana palms or other palms around in um, obviously very rich ecosystems uh, themselves. So now I'd like to move into an example around Darwin Core. Okay, so I've mentioned this, um, I think, a couple of times, Darwin Core being a metadata schema for describing biological things. Um, using standardised ways of what terms are and the elements that they reuse from other standard vocabularies. So what Darwin Core does is um, they use the conventions of schema documentations, which are themselves specific standards, to aid machine parsability and human readability once you know what you're looking for. Okay, so what I'm going to do is navigate to this. Um, oh, and navigate to this website here. Oh, okay. I trust that you can see the Dallin Core um, basic vocabulary um, documentation here. So what this um, documentation says is um, lists, we can see some versions of the vocabulary, but what I want to draw your attention to firstly is that um, under this section four, the term lists that are part of this vocabulary. And you can see we have some fairly standard um, information about, um, uh, about different terms that are incorporated into Darwin Core. Okay, so Darwin Core actually borrow terms from the Dublin Core legacy namespace and also from their terms namespace, so from their terms and their elements. There are also some other lists here. And then here you can see under this um, IRI, which is like a URI, um, it's a resource identifier, okay, a um, it's a persistent link. 
um, you can see that Darwin Core define their own terms for the purpose of biological description, but they also reuse some from Dublin Core. So I'm going to click over to the DC terms, Dublin Core terms, and show you um, here again um, that they are providing us some information about what they um, what they've created and how. And under this section for again terms that are members of this list, and here they are starting to provide us with more information about um, about what terms um, they are using and, and what has been borrowed. For example, there is a location term, okay, which is called location. They provide a definition, a spatial region or named place, and that it actually replaces um, a previous uh, term that they had specified. Okay, the modification was in 2008. Uh, the same thing here actually incidentally has happened with access rights. So they are using the Dublin core terms for access rights to provide information about who can access the resource or, or give an indication of its security status. Uh, but this documentation here is showing the term that it replaced, uh, which was previously specified in the Darwin core term list, but now they have decided to a reuse um, a term from Dublin Core. Okay, so you can see that um, you know you don't have to make all the right decisions at the start. Maybe, uh, and I'm sure they had some very good reasons for choosing um, to have metadata about access constraints rather than access rights. Uh, and in fact, if I even followed this link, it would take us to the Darwin Core Quick Reference Guide. So this is where the um, machine readability documentation um, also is um, complemented by a much more human readable documentation because here in this Quick Reference Guide, we get to see when we look at um, some of these attributes here, um, information that's going to be much more relevant to a human interpreter of the Darwin Core terms than a machine. So um, humans need to know, um, we like to have a bit of a comment um, and a definition and examples. Examples are really good for humans so we know how to apply it and what to expect. And we can see that here in this, for example, modified um, term, it relates to date time when a resource has been changed and also that it's conforming to a specific ISO standard about how to present that time, okay? And that's the YYYYMMDD time and then the time little section after it. Yeah. But anyway, um, so when we, so we've got, um, We've got standard ways of talking about metadata that's useful for humans to interpret and use and apply. And we also have, if I went, if I went backwards, or oh, not sure how I could go backwards in that um, right now, um, to the kinds of terms that the um, computer is going to want to know. So they want to know a bit more about the structure and the whether something's a class or a property and um, the semantic level on how the terms relate to each other, okay? Because um, knowing what values can be aligned or how often a field or element can be repeated and whether it's mandatory or not, so the usage of that metadata description then has implications on the things that we might want to do um, uh, managing that research data at scale. Okay, so decisions that a, for example, a data repository might want to make um, when they're considering bulk ingest of records or transforming records so that they can um, uh, ap apply some preservation, long-term preservation work. Um, this is where it, it matters what the rules are for managing that data. So we really like um, the metadata to aid that reusability to be very clear um, and very accurate when it comes to um, identifying attributes of that data. This is getting really circular references. 
referencey, isn't it? Okay, so let's let's move on. Great, Darwin Core. Okay, now it's time to talk about licensing. Oh, better speed up. Okay, so first I'm going to address licensing and then data citation. Okay, when the aim is actual reuse of research data, this principle encourages us to be clear about how people can do that. So when a data citation tells you where you got data from and can aid provenance in that way, a license sets out your expectations for others to follow. Um, I'm just going to have to acknowledge that this is probably the most meta of slides I could ever give you right now um, and I'll try not to get us lost. So many licenses actually feature attribution as an expectation of usage. And as this slide says, um, Quill West actually, the purpose of attribution is to give credit to the original creator of something you are using. It relates to the thing and is a legal requirement of using openly licensed works, okay? Because this speaks to the fact that a licensed work um, is a, a license is a legal instrument. So although licensing research data tends to come up at publication points, Research data could be licensed during any part of the research life cycle, during planning or negotiating with potential collaborators, for example. I'm going to concentrate on Creative Commons licenses um, after I make a few notes about Australian copyright law, drawing from the ARDC Research Data Management, Research Data Rights Management Guide um, uh, in, in the next one. But as you can see, I am reusing this slide, um, this particular slide, which is from Citations versus Attributions by Quill West. Um, they have licensed it through the Creative Commons Attributions License, CCBY4, which is an international license. And you can see even on this slide, um, there is a picture of a lolcat, um, which has been attributed and um, under a license for Creative Commons attributions and share alike um, 2.0 and they even provide acknowledge that this was a derivation from the original work which was pretty much the picture of the cat without oh hi I open source this for you. Um, okay back to Australian copyright law. So look it's complicated um, uh, but it's a fun time okay so the conventions of um, academia um, to comply with cop copyright have developed citation and attribution practices, okay? Um, and while it is true that Creative Commons licenses can only protect ma material in which copyright or similar rights exist, there are two important considerations at play. Firstly, the strict determination of whether copyright subsists in a data set can be complicated and some data sets will definitely attract copyright. Secondly, for those data publishers and researchers who wish to broadly share their data, protection is not the primary objective in their selection of a particular license or rights statement. Rather, in that case, the dual objectives in the selection of, of a license are, or should be, to unambiguously declare to everyone that the data can be reused and to indicate that the licensor um, would like to be attributed when someone does so. So the bottom line are, is regardless of um, whether copyright exists or not, you can still apply a license to instruct how people might use the data you are making available. So um, as you can see on this slide, Australian law doesn't recognise copyright in machine generated data, but it does recognise human the impact of human authorship which is demonstrated creativity in selection and arrangement of data so if you have um, if you have some raw data and you have um, analyzed it and corrected reformed made modeling choices this may actually influence whether or not copyright subsists in that data set um, but it is always a case-by-case -case basis in Australian law um, and the final um, important point is to know that rights in data usually rest with the creator of that data. 
Um, so this is why we advocate for the use of licenses to make something usable when we want to be sure that we have a method of giving people a license to reuse the data. So we don't want to be resting on the conventions of citation alone. Creative Commons um, suite of licenses have varying levels of usage, which you can bolt on to your data assets. And it's important to acknowledge that they don't waive or replace copyright. And this image here we have is the attribution license, which is quite popular because it's relatively easy to do and maps well to standard academic citation practices. Behind the CC attribution license is a legal instrument that works internationally. Um, that's the version four there. To apply the license, you display this image and the words below, which link to a human readable version, a machine parsable version, and the legal instrument, um, which you are welcome to read. Okay, so let's have a look at what some of these licenses look like in the wild. Um, I'm using an example here from the Australian Ocean Data Network portal. Uh, and this is a, a data set about Australian phytoplankton. Uh, as you can see there, they're using the attribution license, CCBY. Okay. And um, the, um, the portal actually licenses all data within their, um, within their repository um, as CCBY in their data use acknowledgement statement. Over here in the metadata record, and I'm providing a screenshot of that, um, are some additional constraints to attribution um, depending on the parts of the data set that you might be using and how to um, provide attribution. Another example um, is from the Atlas of Living Australia. And this is for the um, uh, little magpie record, the Australian magpie. I should clarify now that I know the difference, roughly. Um, Jim Narina Tibbesen. Um, so the Atlas of Living Australia actually has um, uh, gets data from a lot of different data providers, um, and they all have are welcome to use different licenses. This particular image here, which is um, uh, attached to the record, um, to the Magpie occurrence record is licensed under a CC attribution non-commercial, that's what NC stands for, by um, a contributor called Wingspanner. Um, and, um, and that is just for the use of the image, okay? That is not the whole record. There are other components there. So if I do that special screen sharing thing again, oh, okay. Let's try not to make this terrible. Um, ah, here we are. Okay, so looking at the um, the actual record here, I'm going to scroll down so you can see on this page the provenance um, of the um, or who is providing data to this record is shown by these little provided by and the links to their um, uh, links to the data sets which are being supplied, contributed from various data partners. Actually, if I scroll up, you can look over here and under the data partners tab, I'll just click that now, we can see um, which data partners are providing what data sets and under which terms. And you can see a whole range of CCBYs, um, Creative Commons licenses, sometimes they have non-commercial limitations on them. Sometimes they um, only want um, attribution, only specify attribution. Okay, cool. So um, this is a nice slide into provenance and I'm probably going to finish up with this um, uh, looking at provenance and then we can, um, I'll let uh, Matthias take you deeper into the domain relevant community standards. Um, so what does provenance mean? Okay, well, ultimately, I think it's about asking um, what is useful for the users, um, the researchers to know about how the data was created. Okay, and often it's not until um, somebody goes to actually reuse someone else's data that they realise, 
what is actually practically useful in terms of how the data was created or generated and um, what processes had been applied to that data. So provenance is something that allows people to trust data so that they know where it comes from, how it was created and can be aware of limitations. For example, if we're thinking about a temperature sensor, it might actually only do measurements in whole degrees. Now, we all know that um, temperature um, changes over like, I suppose we could say degrees of degrees. Um, so if you had a data set that only reported temperature um, at particular times um, in whole degree terms, then you would need to be careful about visualising that data and the implications for further analysis when that data had been normalised in that way. Um, here, here is a tale of two sensors um, and I would like to acknowledge this, this is actually from Matthias, um, if you are wondering about the provenance of this example. Um, when we were talking about how do we, how do we talk about reusability um, and, and what is helpful information to know about um, sensors that may have been used in the collection of data. So these sensors are, um, they collect data on humidity readings and temperature. Uh, DH11 and DH22, double one is the blue one actually, double two, the slightly larger one, um, have different ranges ranges of humidity readings. They are optimised differently for temperature, different temperature ranges, and they also perform differently. So they have different rates of accuracy and sampling rates, and there is a slight cost difference. So when the sensor or instruments, any kind of um, research instruments have similar names, the provenance is important because different capabilities will produce different results. So if we were using this particular um, sensor in a data collection activity, it would be very helpful uh, to be able to link out to record the, sen the exact sensor name and then link out to the properties or um, attributes of that sensor. Because then we would know um, what degree of accuracy we can um, infer from the results of the data that that sensor collects. So our decisions in terms of the fair principle of reusability is about being clear and accurate when it counts. I'm, I'm going to skip this one, I think, um, uh, in the interest of having, um, having a chat about and answering any questions you might have. Um, but you can have a look through, my, I'll share the slides after this and you can have a little look through here. Um, uh, it's a nice, uh, this is a nice example of how um, changes in the actual processing um, analysis pipeline mean that um, research teams can get very different results um, from the same data set. So, um, but it's probably time for me to wrap up right now. Um, there are some links and it's a good read. Hey, Matthias. Hey Liz, thank you very much for that um, and for uh, thanks for a graceful recovery that saved me from having to deliver your presentation. Uh, we do have some uh, questions in uh, but there are time for more questions than the number of questions we have so please do type your questions into the question module um, as Liz and I address these first ones. Um, okay so uh, back at about the 12 minute mark, um, you mentioned uh, you were talking about the relevance of metadata attributes uh, and uh, someone in our audience uh, says that sounds highly subjective uh, and asks whether we have any guidance for how broadly um, they should think with respect to assessing relevance. Ah, um, going to be very candid and it kind of goes to um, is, um, nope. Okay, so my candid answer is what can you be bothered with, right? Um, perhaps the more um, prudent response would be what what is fit for purpose? So where do you need to, um, you don't have to collect all of the metadata, but what what is the metadata that really counts um, for, um, for 
example for a um, a repository to provide a reasonable finding aid to the um, contents in their data repository. So how much how much aboutness do they need to know about the research data in order to um, in order to make it easy for people to find the stuff that's in their repository? Uh, and also how this is a this is a pun. It's going to happen. How fair is it on researchers and uh, data stewards, data curators, people? contributing um, data to repositories to ask them to provide extensive descriptive metadata about what they're producing. So you've got to balance it up um, and often um, I think you, you want to be looking at what metadata can you automatically pull from other organisations or other um, enterprise systems first um, and then you know it's that last it's it's the last uh, resort that you want to ask the um, contributors to put in extra data themselves. And also, I guess it kind of depends on the, you know, like the community standards, what people find acceptable to provide. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, okay, next we have a, a jargon busting question. Um, so. Uh, it's possibly a little confusing in that list from the ALA how there are all those different kinds of CC licenses. Um, so this particular question asks, is CC BY a different license to CC BY 4.0? Yes. <laughs> I will expand. There are different versions of licenses. So as um, uh, as the practice of openly licensing outputs and things um, uh, develops um, there are different uh, there are different engagements um, which uh, work according to um, uh, different legal jurisdictions so for example the creative Co um, commons attribution license um, version 3 or 3.0 that works in an Australian context okay Version four is the um, international version of that license, and it also happens to be the latest license. So people have come to a position where they've gone, well, you know what, let's just apply the international license because then that will just work everywhere and we don't have to worry about um, uh, gatekeeping and geographic borders. Um, that is just one step too far. Great, thank you. Um, Okay, uh, another question here. Uh, would you say there is a preference when choosing a Creative Commons license for data sets, especially when we want data to be open? Uh, does it depend on the researcher's preference or choice? Yes, yes. Um, what, I, what I haven't talked about at all uh, are institutional policies around um, intellectual property. Okay, and whether that, how that plays into um, who is providing the data and for what purposes. So um, this is like this is a familiar tension to many of you publishing um, uh, student HDR student theses. Okay, um, and and managing um, different rights there. But well, go back to the question because I think I was coming to the point, but I've forgotten it. Yep. Um, so uh, my understanding, is there a preference for choosing a Creative Commons license over perhaps any other kind of license when it comes to data sets? Yeah. Um, so I think that the Creative Commons licenses are, um, I would recommend them because they are straightforward and they are, um, they work, work well for the purposes of sharing data. Sometimes, like your data could be really, really old, okay? Um, or your, your resources could be really, really old. So in fact, um, copyright may not even come into it and you may have, be able to use something like a public domain mark, which is another thing that the Creative Commons um, licenses include, which is putting things in the public domain and, um, but yeah. hey, there are weeds there. Okay, I can see Matthias starting to feel anxious. <laughs> Yep. Okay, so we've got one last question, uh, and I might handle this one if it's okay, Liz. 
so um, Liz, you asserted that rights and data usually rest with the creator. Uh, can an institution assert their right to IP for data generated by academics in their employ? Also, could a funding body assert the same uh, as a part of the employment or funding contract? Uh, now, the reason why I wanted to answer this one is because I have been through this process. Um, so as an employee, um, an academic, as an employee of a university, anything that they generate, any IP they generate during the course of their work would naturally fall to their employer unless there's been a contract signed saying otherwise. So for example, many institutions will allow their academics to hold the IP of their research outputs, their publications, sometimes even their teaching materials. Um, but these agreements don't generally cover data. So, um, and, and in fact, in the past, I have signed uh, an extra contract. So I had my employment contract, but on top of that, when I worked on a particular project, I was asked to sign an extra piece of paper that explicitly stated that the output of this project belonged to the institution. Now, strictly speaking, that second bit of paper wasn't necessary, but it was certainly an instrument that the institution wanted to use to protect its own IP. Uh, and the same goes for funding um, contracts as well. Um, so, for example, the ARC um, does specify that uh, publications should be released under a particular or should be made openly available um, and other funding bodies do the same. Now, they don't necessarily go as far as saying that they own the research outputs, um, but they certainly do stipulate a particular kind of licensing or, or access that should be used there. Uh, did you have anything to add to that, Liz? Nope, I think you handled that wonderfully. Okay. Uh, all right, that's actually all the questions we have. And I am sorry we ran a little bit over time, but I will hand over to you, Liz, to wrap up. Oh, that's it, everyone. <laughs> um, Matthias will follow up on Wednesday with a bit more detail in um, community standards and looking at um, reusability from. Um, uh, uh, with reference to reproducible workflows. Uh, so stay tuned for that. And um, we will have quiz activities and um, quizzes and activities ready for you for, um, for Wednesday, I hope. Okay, see you later. Bye.